Welcome back to Conceived in Liberty, the Bradley Speaker Series. I'm Rick Graber, president of the Bradley Foundation. Thanks so much for joining us for this series of conversations with former Bradley Prize winners. The culture wars that have long played out in our politics are seeping into every aspect of our society. Sports, entertainment, universities, media, business, all have been caught up in the canceled culture phenomenon that has raced across this country. Our guest on this episode is a prolific scholar, writer, and speaker who has extensively analyzed social and political movements today and throughout history. Victor Davis Hanson is the Martin and Illy Anderson Senior Fellow at the Hoover Institution and chairs the working group on the role of military history in contemporary conflict. He's a military historian, columnist, and scholar of ancient warfare, and has been a commentator on modern warfare and contemporary politics for many years for various media outlets. Victor is a 2008 winner of the Bradley Prize and is a member of the Bradley Foundation's Board of Directors. Victor, welcome, thanks for joining us. Thank you for having me, Rick. Victor, uh, one of your recent columns addressed the cultural dynamics that are playing out in America right now. And in that column, you wrote that puritanical cultural revolutionaries are always a minority of society and that whether they win or lose depends on how quickly and successfully they can terrify people into submission. What's your sense of how far this cultural revolution will go? Will we continue to see a movement to rewrite history, to defund police, to fire people for saying the wrong thing? Or will Americans start to push back? Well, I think they're starting to push back. We saw the Harper's Magazine letter of pushback from liberal intellectuals. We had the Barry Weiss letter from the New York Times columnist that was deplatformed. Steven Pinker survived, uh, Joshua Katz at Princeton survived, the Goya boycott went nowhere. But what makes us a little bit different than the pushback against the J Jacobins or during the, the uh, Red Guards in China, or even the Say Them Wish trials, is that uh, it's an election year and there's Donald Trump and we've never had a trifecta of a national pandemic of this nature with a national quarantine, with a steep recession in an election year with a controversial president. So there's a lot of unknown unknowns here. But I think the people themselves, for all of those reasons, have kept mum, the people being, I think, the majority. And we'll see at Labor Day how they react. And we'll get a little, very quickly, we'll get a few barometers. I think when they see a this week's basketball uh, first game when people either don't stand for the national anthem or they substitute the national anthem or they have sloganeering. Uh, I think there's going to be a pushback there, but a lot of people just aren't going to express themselves openly until we're in September and October, I think. Let, let's stay on that topic. I mean, clearly COVID has disrupted our lives in, in ways that we couldn't have anticipated. And many, if not most Americans, uh, just want to enjoy things such as watching professional sports, anything that seems normal. Yet the NFL and the NBA are mired in controversy. They've apparently bowed to uh, pressure from the left. What, just, what does it say about our society when American pastimes that used to unite us are now just another flashpoint? Well, whatever we think about these cultural Marxists, these revolutionaries, they've been very brilliant because they, are, they don't have a very large constituency in terms of demographics, but they're very influential in the universities, the foundations, the media, Hollywood, entertainment, and they exercise that propaganda in a brilliant way. And what they're doing is they're rewriting American history and trying to make the argument that the majority owes them things for elemental or mortal sins in the past that can only be erased by reparatory action in the future. And so everybody from Cervantes to Father Sarah to Robert E. Lee to George Washington, statues are toppled, TV shows are canceled, uh, schools are renamed, and it's it's... It's Jacobin in nature, it's holistic, 360 degrees, everything we do, what we eat, what we look at, how we dress, how we talk, 
all of that is being recalibrated in the way that the Jacobins, you know, renamed this, the, the year, they renamed the days of the months. And that's what these people are doing. And the ultimate goal is to enthrone uh, a small number of mo socialists and Marxists who will then recalibrate the, the economy and how we live, where we live, what we say, the language will change. And the final thing, Rick, is it's, it's a little strange because this revolution, as we saw during the Democratic primaries, candidates that espoused it, like Bernie Sanders, they, didn't, they weren't nominated. And the more left wing dropped out. But because of these freak events, these uh, perfect storm of events, Joe Biden, given his cognitive challenges, has opened a door for these people to come into power without an election through the vice presidency. We haven't seen that since 1944, when Henry Wallace may well have been president, who was a socialist dash, maybe even communist, had not, he, he'd be kicked off the ticket because everybody knew FDR was not going to last long in his fourth term. But we're in that situation again. But I don't see anybody wanting a centrist Democrat on the ticket with the idea that they may be president sooner than later. It's just the opposite. Uh, you talk about universities and you've been very critical of the role that universities have played in fueling the, the riots and the protests that we've seen this summer. And you wrote that younger people who've been participating in them seem self-assured without justification. Uh, and that ultimately the reason for that are our universities in this country. What should the universities be doing differently? What can we do to instill in young people an appreciation for America's founding principles? Well, the university had always two missions. They were to teach people to think inductively, that is to look at examples or facts or data, and then come to conclusions based on their interpretation of that data. It was not to start with a deductive premise that the United States is racist, sexist, homophobic, imperialist, and then make examples from history fit that. And that's what they're doing now. And then second, it was to give people a broad basis to make those inductive assessments. They should know what Iwo Jima is. They should know what uh, the Battle of Gettysburg. They should know who James Madison was. They should know what the Statue of Liberty, where it is and who gave it to us. All of those basics that we all learned in K through 12 and in college, they're not getting. And what are they getting and instead? They're getting a deductive race, class, gender menu from their teachers and especially in higher education. So we know what the problem is, Rick, but the answers would be so revolutionary to, at this late date to save the university, we would have to, I think, cut off federal guarantees of student loans and make the u university share moral hazard. And that is they would have to guarantee their own loans. And that would make a lot of the superfluous administrative uh, bloat and faculty, they couldn't afford to do it. I, don't, I think we'd have to tax the endowments on the premise that they're no longer nonpartisan, and that would make them uh, veer back to the center to reclaim their tax exempt status. I think they should have an exit test, just like they have an entry test with an SAT. I have making suspicion after spending most of my life in academia that students' SAT scores either would not go up or they would not uh, they might go down after four years, but I think they should have an exit test as a qualification for the BA. Got to get rid of tenure and give five-year contracts where we spell out exactly what faculty are expected in a contractual manner. And finally, I think it'd be very good. The schools of education are the, the depots where this thought collects in the universities and it's transmitted to the K through 12. It would be very good if when people graduate, they have the option of either getting a teaching credential or bypassing the School of Education and getting a master's for one year. I think most students and young faculty that were gonna go into teaching would prefer the master's. They could do it in a year. It would give them more academic uh, gravitas and they would be, avoid that therapeutic curriculum. Really interesting ideas. Earlier this year, February, I believe, you wrote that from a historical perspective, the 2020 election was Trump's to lose. But that was before COVID, that was before George Floyd. Do you think the election is still Trump's to lose? It's a very good question because as I said, at that point he was in, he, he had 
the powers of government to make decisions on the economy, on foreign policy, and on the perceptions of his own competency. And remember the Gallup had him, I think, as late as May at 50%. So he was on his way to reelection on the Democrats, I think would concur with that assessment, especially after the unimpressive Democratic primaries. But now he has no control over the virus. We're seeing countries like Japan, Australia, that had done very well having these spikes. They're not serious spikes and they're different from the original ones, but they appear in the media as confirmation that government can't control it. And he has no control over that. If you don't open the schools, then parents cannot go to work. And local school districts, he has no control over. And yet the American uh, Pediatric Association says you got to get kids back in school, but he, I don't think that's going to happen. So the economy is not going to restart fully. And we've never seen a situation, Rick, I can't remember, and I grew up in grade school during the 60s, where governors, police chiefs even in some cases, but surely big state mayors either tolerate the demonstrations and the rioting or they, by, they might even be an encouraging it. And that means that that narrative that things are spiraling out of control and the president is to blame, that's the same thing. What he, there is some cause for, uh, for optimism because I think the virus, just as we had that quick spike, we're gonna have another one in September, but it will, it's already on the downward, it's already descending. And then I do think the economy will start to percolate back by October. The key is not to get it back, yet, but to have signs that it's on recovery, in recovery. But it, Trump is walking on stepping stones through a minefield, and he can't afford to have another ill-advised tweet. He has to be sober and judicious, and uh, he has to project an image that he he's in control of the uncontrollable. And uh, that's going to be difficult. But I still think the odds are 55-45 he can win. I know that sounds kind of uh, unhinged given the mainstream polls, but there are some polls. Rasmussen was pretty accurate in 2016. He had on uh, Friday, 49-49. The Trafalgar polls of states have him within striking distance in the key, in many of the key states. So, and uh, at this time, I think July 27th of two, 1988, George H.W. Bush was 17 points back. So we'll see if there's a Lee Atwater in the uh, Trump camp that can yes. do to the caucus, uh, do to Biden what they did to the caucus. Last question, Victor. There, there really are two competing versions of America right now, and you've explored that in a recent column. One version believes that America is racist and needs to radically erase much of its history, and the other version believes that uh, America is the world's only successful multiracial democracy. Do you think that uh, those that wish to preserve the principles and institutions of American exceptionalism have just been too quiet? Oh, absolutely. They've been far too quiet. Uh, some of them are afraid that they'll be canceled out either on social media or by their employers, or they feel, well, these blue state governors and mayors created these socialist utopias. Let's just watch, stand back and watch what happens and they get what they deserve. Or uh, they just say, I'm going to go into a monastery of the mind, so to speak. I'm gonna tune out of professional sports. I'm not gonna to go to the movies. Let them have it. I've got mine. I'm, and that's a, a wrong attitude because they, they being the hard left, if they can convince the country that they're going to win in the sense of seize power, then most people are not ideological. The 80% in the middle just want to get along and they will make the necessary adjustments as they see fit to, uh, to come to terms with the left. I, I, so just to finish, I see it as sort of much of the country's in a fetal position and they have their hands like this and they're saying, I can't take the lockdown, I cannot take the contagion, I cannot take the violence, I cannot take the cancel culture. Make it all go away. And maybe, just maybe, if they get Trump out, they'll be nice again and, and they'll say, okay, but it was all about Trump, it wasn't about you. That's a flawed idea. But if people continue to have that possum-like attitude, they're gonna be shocked 
because whether you look at the Bolsheviks or whether you look at the Red Guards or whether you look at the Jacobins, they are not moderate people. And this country will not look the same after November. I know everybody says that every election year, but this year it's going to be a little different. We haven't seen a Democratic Party like this in my, my lifetime. Victor Davis Hanson, thanks so much for your insights and perspectives. It certainly is going to be a fascinating second half of 2020. And thanks to all of you for joining us once again on Conceived in Liberty, the Bradley Speaker Series.